in this session, I'm just going to uh, touch a little bit on spiritual gifts uh, that give us an edge. But I just want to just, you know, start by talking about the meaning of that word edge. You know, when you say edge, and that's the theme of this year's uh, Christian Professionals Conference, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, an advantage that you and I have as believers. But we are out on a common playing field. And the playing field we're talking about is our uh, work life or our professional sphere. Uh, we are all on the same playing field, but that as believers, we must know that we actually have an edge, uh, a spiritual, Bible-based, God-given edge in our workplace uh, that puts us in a place of advantage, uh, you know, uh, uh, so that we can uh, shine, we can glorify God, we can advance the purposes of God's kingdom, and in the process, we ourselves can be blessed, of course. Uh, so we're talking about that advantage. So this morning, we heard about, you know, how we have an advantage in our decision-making process when we do it based on the Word of God, right, uh, rather than uh, the customary process of uh, making decisions. Uh, we also heard how we have an edge uh, in our emotional intelligence. Now, that's a big thing, and that's actually a very important thing in, in the workplace these days. Of course, you need to have your professional skills, but what gives you an edge is the emotional quotient or the emotional intelligence that you bring to your workplace. Why is one person promoted while the other person is not when both may be equally skilled and equally experienced? And very often, it is that one person has a higher EI or emotional intelligence. He's just able to handle emotions, is a, not only the personal emotions, but also the emotions of people around. And therefore, they would prefer to raise that person up to a higher position of leadership because they know that person has a higher EI, right? And that person is going to keep moving. Now, as believers, we understand that given all that God has given to us spiritually, uh, we can actually have an edge even in that sphere uh, of emotional quotient or your emotional intelligence. Uh, and, and we heard a lot about that and uh, Deepu uh, shared with us on that. So uh, just to add to this, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, spiritual skills that we can bring to our workplace. Uh, you know, uh, uh, traditionally, uh, most believers... Uh, uh, you know, live two lives, meaning we separate our spiritual life and our work life or our professional life. Uh, yes, God is there, but he is somewhere outside at the door. Uh, I have left him there when I walked in at 8.30, and I will pick him up at 5.30 when I come back. <laughs> you know, that, that God, there is that disconnect from God, faith, uh, what I learn in, in church, what I heard on Sunday, to the realities of what I have to do in my workplace. I've got to deal with people. I've got to deal with customers. Uh, I've got to solve problems. I've got to develop systems. I've got to design systems or I've got to architect, whatever, you know, whatever walks. Like you're a teacher, I've got to deal with these noisy kids in class or whatever things that actually are pressing on us in our place of work. Many times as believers, there's this disconnect. But what I want to do, uh, hopefully, in this, this session today, uh, 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 obviously, in, in, in these 40 minutes, we're not going to you know, learn everything about all the spiritual skills and how to use them. But hopefully, we'll have enough just to you know, stir up your appetite to say that I need to make an effort to grow in my spiritual skills so that those can, I can bring them to bear in my workplace. And in reality, the more we're able to employ the spiritual skills God has given to us or made available to us, the greater impact we're going to have in the workplace. Some of the great inventors, some of the great movers and shakers of our world were strong believers and they knew how to draw on their spiritual skills uh, to make an impact in the workplace. And so that's the goal of the session. I just want to encourage us along that line so that leaving from here this evening, you'll, you'll, you'll be stirred up to say, look, I need to grow uh, in these spiritual skills so that I can actually have greater impact for the kingdom of God, uh, not, not for a selfish uh, agenda, not for my own gain, but for the kingdom of God, uh, and I can advance the kingdom of God as I grow in my spiritual skills. Um, uh, but just leading up to the skills that I want to talk about this evening, um, I just want to uh, present to us four 
important truths, biblical perspectives concerning the workplace. For those of you who've been at APC for some time, this might come just as a reminder. It's like, I've heard this the hundredth time. <laughs> if, if, if that's your, you know, if that's great. Hear it for the hundred and first time today. Just be reminded of it again. Uh, you know, this is so important. But for some of us, I, I understand this might be new. Uh, and so uh, I just feel we need to go over these, uh, these truths again. Uh, a biblical perspective of the workplace. Number one, uh, we need to understand that God designed work. Uh, and has, hence, he's very interested in being involved at the workplace. You know, your work was designed, work was designed by God. Uh, that should sink into you. Work was God's idea, not the devil's. Right? Uh, Genesis 2.15. Even before the fall, God spoke to Adam and he gave him work to do. Right? He put, the Bible says he put Adam in the garden not to sing songs to him morning till evening. No. He put Adam in the garden to tend it and to keep it so adam had work to do he was to cultivate the garden he was tending it cultivating the garden and he was guarding the garden obviously there was an adversary who was trying to intrude and destroy what god wanted to do so adam had work to do so work is god's idea when god created adam he put him on the earth and he gave him an assignment that's called work so I want you to see something, and this is something that should be deeply seated in you. Your work is your ministry. Okay? Don't go looking, what is my ministry? If you're working, you already have a ministry. Your work is your ministry. Let's be bold enough to say this statement. My work is my ministry. I am in the ministry. You are in the ministry. Your work is your ministry. You say, why do you say my work is my ministry? Because that's God's assignment for you. What is the definition of ministry? Ministry is you doing God's assignment for your life. That's ministry. And work is God's assignment to you. So your work is your ministry. You are doing something God has ordained for your life. Uh, so there is no thing, no, no need to go, around. I'm searching for my calling. You know, I'm working as a software engineer, but I'm searching for my calling. Hey, this is your calling. You're called as an anointed, uh, devil-chasing, God-believing, miracle-working software engineer. <laughs> you're, that's your calling. That's your ministry. So write good code. <laughs> but while you're writing good code... Glorify Christ. Do the work of the ministry. That's it. You're already called, anointed, commissioned. Don't keep searching for your calling. Fulfill your calling. You see? So work is, is God's assignment for you. It is designed by God. It is, it is God's assignment for your life. You are a minister of God. Paul calls us. He says, you know, in, in Ephesians 6, he says, we are, uh, people are going to work. He calls us as ministers of Christ. Do you know you're already called as a minister of Christ? You see, you who, who are, who are uh, an employee, you are a minister of Christ in that place of work. So you're already a servant of God in that place of work. So you need to see yourself like that. God has designed what I'm given to do. And he's very interested in this. Uh, you're a manager, very interested. Uh, you're a team leader, he's very interested. You're you know, a VP or you're head of a business unit, whatever. God's interested in that. Uh, he's right there. So don't leave him at the door and say, I'll see you at 6 o'clock, Lord. No, he's right there next to you, in you at your place of work. So that should be deeply rooted in our hearts. The second truth we must understand as far as the workplace is concerned is the cross impacts the workplace. You know, sometimes we think about the cross and uh, it is true that, you know, the very most important thing about the cross of Jesus is that uh, we are saved, uh, we are redeemed, and we are brought into a, a relationship with God. But I want us to think uh, beyond that and try to understand this truth that the cross actually impacts my place of work. And you say, how can we say that? Well, let's start with this very fundamental question. Uh, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, did he redeem us from all of the consequences of the fall 
Or did he redeem us only from part of it? All right, Menti, 100%. <laughs> All. <laughs> so everyone here unanimously says Jesus redeemed us from all of the consequences of the fall. So think with me on this. What was one of the consequences of the fall that affected the workplace? We find that was, in fact, the very first pronouncement that God made when Adam and Eve sinned. He, he cursed the serpent. He said, you know, you're going to crawl on your belly. He announced the coming of the Savior. He said, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Then what did, what did God do? He cursed the ground. That was Adam's workplace. If Adam was working on a computer, the computer would have been cursed. I don't know. That Adam's, that was his workplace. He cursed the ground. He said, the ground is cursed. Now, from now on, from the, with, the, with the toil and the sweat of your brow, you're going to work. The ground is going to produce thorns and thistles. I mean, it's going to be hard. Before the fall, the ground was blessed. Adam was working there. He was cultivating it, and it was beautiful. Uh, he would, you know, you can imagine all the... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> You could just imagine how, you know, the whole garden would be blooming and Adam would be so excited. Hey, I planted that seed and look what's happening. But now the ground was cursed. His workplace was impacted before, because of the fall. Now, thorns and thistles, would it will produce by the sweat of your brow. You're going to work hard, but you're going to see little effect coming out of it. Question. Was that the result of the fall? Yes. Did Jesus Christ redeem us from the entirety of the fall? Yes. Which means your redemption, Christ's work of redemption also impacts redemption of your workplace. Amen. So when you go to your workplace, you have to see it as this workplace, what I'm working at, is redeemed. Because I am a redeemed person. Everything about me is therefore redeemed, including the place I work. So the cross impacts your place of work. When you could say like something like this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died to redeem your workplace. The Bible says he died to redeem all things. That includes your workplace. So for you as a believer, you must see your workplace under the power of the cross. It's under the power of the blood. It is a redeemed place of work. It is not going to be for you. It's not going to be the, uh, you're not going to be under the curse of the fall. But you're going to be somebody, for you the workplace is going to be an experience of Christ's redemptive work there. Are you with me? But understand that you have to enforce it. You have to enforce it. Otherwise, you're, going, you're not going to, you and I are not going to walk in the blessings of the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. So let's say this. The cross releases blessing on my workplace. Right? The cross releases blessing on my workplace. Right? The fall cursed my workplace. The cross releases blessing on my workplace. And you need to see that. Because the workplace was cursed. Um, you, you know, in fact, God told in, in, in Genesis 3, when you read that pronouncement that God made, he said, you'll have to work hard, sweat to make the soil produce anything. And uh, he said, uh, uh, that, that word, that word uh, work hard, it really talks about worrisome, painful labor. Do you know that you and I are redeemed from worrisome, painful labor? Now, if you and I are saying, my, my workplace is just exactly like that. Today, you change it. You say, I'm going to bring the cross of Jesus to bear on my workplace. I declare my workplace delivered. My workplace redeemed by the cross. It is not going to be a worrisome, painful place for me it is going to be a place of blessing because of the cross of jesus is this 
Too much to digest or you think you can't take it? Yeah, because this is true. Jesus died on the cross to redeem us from all of the fall. That includes what happened to the workplace. So that's the second truth that must be deeply rooted in us. Because uh, you must understand that the full blessing of the cross of Christ, you can enforce in your place of work. When it comes to demonic activity, when it comes to, you know, that the enemy is doing stuff in your workplace. He's trying to obstruct you. You're going to, all these things the enemy does. You know, you say, Satan, you bow before me in my place of work. On the authority of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now you say, Pastor, I don't think the devil is interested in my workplace. Hey, he's very interested. You know, he was in the workplace before you and I came. The 28th chapter of Exodus talks about one of the things Satan was doing. He was managing the, uh, the trading of the world. When Satan tempted Jesus, he said, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, all the glory of this I will give you. So whose hand has all that? Revelation 18 talks about mystery Babylon. There are two Babylons, 17 and 18. 17, Revelation 17 talks about Babylon, the world religious system. Revelation 18 talks about Babylon, the world financial system. And you find Revelation 18 clearly says that, that the, it's filled with demonic works. And it says that Babylon collapses. So the world financial system will collapse. Uh, uh, but it really sh it shows us clearly that it's filled with the influence of demonic spirits. So don't tell me when you go to work, Satan is waiting outside. No, he's right there. He's in the boardroom. He's in the, you know, in all these Wherever, because he's influencing policies, he's influencing decisions, he's influencing mindsets. Why do you think media is so corrupt? Why do you think they come up with such creative ads that are so filthy? Why? Why do you think there is so much of, you know, almost every sphere of influence, you see the handiwork of Satan. So don't tell me the devil is not at work. He's very hard at work in that sphere of influence. So you and I have to contend with the enemy in the place of work. On what basis are you going to contend with the devil at your workplace? On the basis of the cross. Amen? So as a believer, you need to be convinced that the cross of Jesus Christ impacts your place of work. You need to know that. And you need to know that you are there to enforce it. You are there to bring the redemptive work of Christ on the cross to your place of work. You are authorized to do it. And you and I have to do it. The cross of Jesus, bring it to bear on your place of work. The third truth you and I must understand, again, these, these things might be familiar to you, is that God desires to reveal himself uh, through us in the workplace. Right? God is inside you, and he's saying, hello, I want to show myself to all your colleagues. I want to reveal myself through you to people around you. Right? We call that manifest. Right? The manifestations of the spirit. What is it? It's making God visible. Right? So God wants uh, to reveal himself through us in the workplace. Uh, like we heard, if we, when you're in the workplace, your life, you are a window to God. So people should see God through you. You're a window to God. And God wants to reveal that, himself through you. Right? Uh, Psalm 90, it's not on the screen here. Psalm 90, verse 16, 16 and 17, beautiful verses. It says, you know, Lord, let your work appear to your servants, your glory to the children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be seen upon us. Establish the work of our hands. He has established the work of our hands. So he's saying, God, let your beauty be seen on us. How? By you establishing the work of our hands. That means God's beauty is seen through your, the work of your hands, God's beauty is seen. Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17. So when you go to your workplace, God, I thank you. You be made visible through me uh, in my place of work. Let people see you through me. That's the third truth that, you, that is established in your heart as a professional uh, in the workplace. 
this is it. God is, I'm, I'm here to put God on display. I'm here to get people to see God through me in this place of work. Right? And the last two, the fourth one that I just want to mention here is this, that God empowers us to engage the workplace. There is a supernatural empowering that comes from God, which is what we want to talk about uh, the rest of the time here. That there is this empowering. God empowers us for the workplace. Uh, you know, today we'll call them as spiritual skills. You can give it whatever name you want. But there is this empowering that comes from God for you as a believer in your place of work. God has not left you there by yourself. It's like, okay, you go. I'll see you in the evening. No, when you're at your place of work, God is there to empower you. And you and I need to understand how to receive that empowering so that we can put God on display, so that we can advance the kingdom of God, so that we can be blessed if God, God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to prosper. Of course, those things are there in the Bible. Now, and there are benefits that you and I enjoy by being in the workplace, of course. But our greater objective is to see God glorified and his kingdom advance in the hearts and lives of people. In order to do that, we must learn how to receive this empowering that's available for us in the workplace. You all with me so far? All right. So let's talk about these spiritual skills. Um, just to help us today, I've, uh, I, 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 I've divided this into these four areas of grace or empowering or spiritual skills that you want to we can break it down. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll cover these four areas. And I just want us to understand, you know, uh, these things that we hear about in church. And very often, we hear them in the context of uh, living good Christian lives, victorious Christian lives, or uh, uh, successful Christian lives. We hear all of this in that context, and maybe we box them into that context, right? Okay, uh, I heard this, but it applies to me how, uh, as a, how I live my Christian life. I want you to expand that, right? And I want you to think about all of these concepts, which many of you may have already heard. They're not new. But I want you to look at them as spiritual skills that actually empower you in your place of work. That give you an edge, an advantage over other people. In your place of work. And, I, and when I talk about, when we talk about edge or advantage, we don't talk, speak about it in a negative sense. It's like, you know, you're not looking down on people, ha, ah, you're bad, you're worse off than me, you don't have this. No, you're just saying, look, I have this edge in order to glorify God, in order to advance kingdom purposes, in order to bless lives. And of course, I will be blessed in the process. Right? So you're not, when you talk about edge, we're not talking about it in a way that, look, I, I want to look down on other people, but I'm using what God has made available to me. So we'll go through each of these four quadrants. Um, you know, uh, what I'm going to do is just basically talk about it and just give biblical examples. Ideally, I would like to talk about real life scenarios and I also like to talk about uh, personal experiences, but we won't have time. That'll be like a weekend school. <laughs> so we, we won't make this a week in school. We'll just make it an introduction to the week in school. <laughs> so uh, I will just touch on these things, maybe just narrate a few Bible examples, which um, many of us will be familiar with. Uh, uh, maybe try to mention a few real life scenarios uh, if possible, uh, but just you know, kind of touch on these four areas uh, and then also try to close off today by saying, you know, What's it going to take for us to develop these skills? Uh, how are we going to grow in these skills? Skills have to be developed. They have to be acquired. They have to be assimilated into our lives. Uh, they have to be, become part of us as we you know, go about our daily uh, uh, things in, in our workplaces. So I will touch on that a little bit uh, and then uh, let you work on it. So the first quadrant, uh, we, we talk about prayer, faith, and a renewed mind. See, this is available to all of us as believers. We know about it. We know I can pray. I can have faith. I can walk with a renewed mind. But what bearing does prayer, faith, and a renewed mind have on my workplace? When I am dealing with all kinds of things, situations, etc. What does that connect? And that's what I'm trying to do here uh, in, in talking about this. Now think about prayer. 
in what ways can you and I use uh, prayer? Why is that skill relevant to me in my workplace? Uh, there are several things you and I can think about. You know, we, uh, we can receive guidance from God in a moment. You know, you're writing a proposal. You are, you have to work on an estimate. You have to, uh, you know, write a quote. You have to uh, try to close a sales deal. You have whatever. Prayer. You use it to receive guidance. You use uh, prayer as a skill through which you receive strength in adversity. Right? Because you know, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now you're facing adversity at work, made hard, whatever hardship it is. Uh, 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 but through prayer, we are receiving strength in the midst of adversity. Uh, through prayer, we receive peace. In turbulent times, we receive courage uh, to face challenges. The prayer is a simple skill. But see what it can do for you in your workplace. There's a great advantage of developing your prayer life. And a great example, of course, many of us would like to look at Daniel, right? Think about Daniel. Daniel, throughout his life, he prayed, prayed, prayed. And it impacted his place of work. So you can imagine Daniel was, you know, if he was in a modern day, let's translate the modern day situation. He was working for Prime Minister Modi. Yeah. And the Prime Minister decided a rule that all Christians must be dismissed from the government. No Christians in the government. I'm just making it up, right? But I'm drawing a parallel between Daniel chapter 2 and what could happen today. And Daniel says, Prime Minister, give me one night. To God, what do I do? He gets together for other people. You know, all the jobs are online. But they pray that night. And God speaks to Daniel. Reveals a certain secret of Prime Minister Modi. So he goes next morning. Prime Minister, I have something to say. And he says that. And Modi says, where did you get that secret from? Nobody knows. Not even Amit Shah. <laughs> Nobody knows. Daniel says, the God of heaven has revealed this to me. Next day, the order changes. We want Christians in the government. <laughs> I mean, I'm just drawing a parallel. Imagine he was under pressure, tremendous pressure. His life and the life of all his friends were on the line. One night of prayer changed everything. Prayer, a skill to receive a word from God that changed the situation. Right? Or Daniel chapter 6, we know how he was fearless. Uh, people are against him. They're conspiring against him. How do we get rid of this man? He's so good, we can't find any fault with him. Only except against his own faith. Right? So they conspire. But then Daniel prays. And his prayer causes, again, things to change. So prayer is a skill that, that we can bring to bear in our workplace. And these stories all have to do with workplace. Daniel was not sitting inside seminary. He was working. Right? For three different empires. The Medes, uh, the, uh, the Babylonians, the Medes, and then the Persians. Three world empires. He's working for three different kings. He had a long tenure. And he had an impact over there. Through prayer. Faith. Our faith in God. Can, we can bring that to bear in our workplace. We can take on Goliaths. Meaning uh, uh, an assi assignments that nobody else wants to take up. Who wants to go and fight Goliath? None in the army. No one. No. Who wants to go and revive that business unit that is dying? No applicants. But what if God wants you to be the David that raises that, revives that business unit? 
But look, if God wants you to be the one to take up that challenge in your place or work. So that Goliath could mean so many different things in so many uh, different workplace scenarios. But why not you be the David in your workplace? Simply because you are a person of faith in God. And you kill that Goliath that nobody else is willing to go kill. So does faith have anything to do with my workplace? Of course. You can use faith to kill giants in your workplace. To uh, overcome uh, challenges. Whether it's adversity, injustice, unfairness, deceit. You take authority over it. You calm storms, raging storms in your workplace. So, in, for instance, in your workplace, if, let's say, you're, you, you have a team of people, and, and suddenly there's a shift in their attitude, well, what do you do? Of course, you can, up, you can appeal to HR, and you can do all the normal things that people would do in an organization, but you as a believer, you say, I take authority. Now, you're not manipulating people, but you're dealing with the spirits behind it. You're dealing with the situation. You're dealing with the storm. So there are winds and waves that are causing the storm. You have a right to deal with the winds and the waves. With the winds that are causing those waves. So Jesus said, peace, be still. You are right to do that. So you take, because of your faith in God, you say, I take authority over the situation. And in the name of Jesus, I bind every spirit of animosity. I bind every spirit of confusion. I command this confusion to stop. The problem with many of us is we think if I'm informed, I'm automatically equipped. And that's not right. Just because you're informed doesn't mean you're equipped. Just because you know there is prayer and there you know there is spirit for life and you know there are gifts. Doesn't mean you, that you know how to operate in them. To learn how to, to learn the nitty gritties of how it happens, we need to be equipped. And that's the responsibility God has given the local church. He's given us, he's given the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists for what? For the equipping of the saints. That means God's people had to be equipped to do the work of ministry. What is ministry? Whatever you do in life that God's assigned you to do, which is your workplace. You're equipped for your ministry. So there is this equipping that has to take place for you and me. I just want to propose this, and I'll be close with this. The last one, uh, you know, this is how equipping happens, right? Uh, and this is a learning process all of us are familiar with. Only 10% of all our learning takes place through what we call the formal learning. Right now, this is very formal. Formal learning is lectures you attend, classes you go to, books you read, videos you watch, online learning courses you do. That's learning, but that's only 10% of the equipping that actually comes into your life. So if all we do is sit in lectures and lectures and lectures, we're still in that 10% space. Are you understanding? 20% of our learning comes through what we call a social, which means we learn from each other, we learn through discussions, we learn uh, by listening to other people's experiences, and uh, the social part. And that's great. That's why we belong to a church community. Uh, that's why we learn. Uh, we, we do things in life groups and we do things in small groups and we interact, we talk, we discuss. But that's 20% of our learning. 70% of our learning is experiential. That means you've got, you, we need the 10% because the 10% uh, uh, gives us the understanding we need, the how to's, the don't do's. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, under, we need that 10%. We need the 20% so we can learn from each other, uh, do the discussions, answer our questions, clear our heads, and all of that. So we need the 20 But really, unless we get into the 70%, which is experiential, we are not actually going to be equipped. Are you with me? So which means, I wanna, this is where I want to leave us. God has made us all these spiritual skills available for us. Look, all this available. If you and I take it to our workplace, it's going to make a difference. We're going to be people on the cutting edge 
of whatever we are doing. We're going to be people advancing. We're going to be pushing the limits. We're going to be advancing the frontiers of science. We're going to be advancing the frontiers of medicine, of business. Uh, you're going to find believers who are on the frontiers pushing the limits. And they have an edge because they're able to take all the spiritual skills into their workplace. But for that, you start with the 10% where you attend weekend school. <laughs> all right. You know, you, you receive it in church or what some that formal learning takes place. You come, you learn, you understand the concepts, you your eyes are open, your questions are answered. Then you're also part of those the social that uh, they means other uh, like minded peer group people who are, you talk, you discuss and all that. So all that's happening, you're learning. But then you but that readies you for the experiential work. Now you have the courage. You also have the information you need. Uh, you're clear. You're confident. Now you start ex ex uh, putting it into action. You start putting it to work. And the more you put it to work, the more you're actually being equipped. You're equipping yourself. You're developing those skills that you need. And then you're going to have impact. You're going to make a difference. Amen? All right. So I want to stop with that. Just to encourage us as God's people. That, you know, there are, all of this has been made available to us as believers. And we can grow in these things. We've just touched on the surface. Or we can delve deeper into this and say, how do these things work when I go to the workplace? We need to explore more, experience more, and learn together more. So may we be a big learning community where we have that input being given to us, but we also interact with each other, discuss with each other, share with each other the experiences. Uh, you may have, hey, I went to my, I was in my place of work, I had this situation happen, but I heard from God, I did it. So that testimony will encourage five other people that you shared with. So that's that social thing where we are learning to get that. And then as each one begins to step out, step out, you're reinforcing that learning in your own life. And imagine a community of believers where everybody is taking spiritual skills into their place of work, uh, making decisions based on the word of God, strong emotionally by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're able to make a difference. We'll have huge impact on where it matters most. It's the workplace. Amen?